When most people think about NASA, I think they probably mostly think about space. I mean, after all, the NASA logo has stars on it, and the S in NASA stands for space. In some of NASA's most well-known programs, like the Apollo program, the Space Shuttle program, and the Voyager and Deep Space probes, or in space. But while NASA has made significant contributions to space research and deep space exploration, their full name is the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. Arguably, their contribution to the field of aeronautics has been every bit as important as their contributions in space. The red vector on the NASA logo actually represents an airfoil, the aeronautics part of NASA. And one thing you might not be familiar with is the significant role that NASA has played in the development of air traffic management systems. According to the Federal Aviation Administration, more than 45,000 flights fly across the United States every day, and each of those has to take off and to land and to travel across an incredibly complex network in order to, well, not run into each other. It's history that deserves to be remembered. It took some time for commercial aviation to take shape and for regular passenger travel by airplane to become common or even comfortable. The world's first scheduled flight service began on January 1st, 1914, when the St. Petersburg-Tampa Airboat Line began offering passenger flights across Tampa Bay. The line ceased operations by April, but it presaged what would eventually become a massive industry. Initially, planes flew at only a few hundred feet, generally navigating by landmarks on the ground. Around the world, the 1920s saw an explosion of commercial airlines. The Lawson Airline Company designed the first U.S. transport planes with an idea towards establishing a commercial airline at the tail end of World War I. In 1919, they introduced the Lawson L-1, which could carry 10 passengers, and the L-2, which could carry 26. Alfred Lawson, a former professional baseball player and founder of the company, took the plane on a 2,000-mile tour to promote commercial flight, but the company failed in 1922. The interwar period would mark the birth of commercial air travel. Airline companies began to form all over the world, some of which remain in operation, including the Netherlands-based KLM and Colombia's Avianca in 1919, Qantas in Australia in 1920, and Czech Airlines in 1923. The proliferation of planes and air travel brought new risks, however. On April 7, 1922, two planes took off, one from Croydon in England and another from Le Bourget near Paris. Flying in poor weather, the two planes collided over Picardy, France, Everyone on board both planes, including three passengers, were killed. The accident led to a meeting in Croydon that instituted some of the first rules of air traffic, including for traffic to keep to the right and the creation of clearly defined air routes in France, England, and the Netherlands. In the 1920s, the U.S. began considering regulating air traffic. At the time, air travel was extremely dangerous and accidents were common, especially in the flying circuses of daredevil barnstorming pilots. President Coolidge appointed a naval board to make a recommendation on federal air regulation. On the board was William Durand, a member of the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics. The NACA was a major supporter of federal regulation of air safety, and the board's recommendation led to the passage of the 1926 Air Commerce Act, which created an aeronautics division within the commercial department in charge of regulation. The division would be in charge of creating new airways, improving flight navigation, and certifying and licensing pilots. This included finishing the construction of a transcontinental lighted airway. The 20s saw the construction of the first towers, with Croydon, England, building a 15-foot-tall wooden aerodrome control tower in 1920. In 1929, the Lambert St. Louis Airport became the first airport with an air traffic control system, when it hired Archie Lee as the country's first air traffic controller. Initially, his office was a wheelbarrow on the runway with an umbrella to give him shade in the summer, and it carried two flags he could use to signal planes— a checkered flag for go, and a red flag that meant halt. Within a few years, the airport built its own traffic control tower, and League became the airport's first radio controller. The first tower in the U.S. to use radio communication was built at the Cleveland Airport in 1930. Radio transformed air traffic control, and by 1932, the Commerce Department installed 83 radio beacons around the country, which transmitted beams that helped pilots navigate. As traffic increased, the airlines established Air Route Traffic Control Centers, or ARTCCs, with the first established at Newark, New Jersey, in December of 1935. More followed quickly at Cleveland and Chicago. Numerous high-profile accidents in the 30s instigated calls for greater accountability. Especially important was the Transcontinental and Western Air Flight 6 crash on May 6, 1935, near Atlanta, Missouri. 
Flying in bad weather and low on fuel, the DC-2 clipped the ground, killing five, including New Mexico Senator Bronson M. Cutting. A congressional committee was formed which heavily criticized the Commerce Department's Bureau of Air Commerce, which was in charge of investigating its own conduct. This crash was part of what led the Commerce Department to assume responsibility for the air route traffic control centers from the airlines. That wasn't enough to stem the criticism, however, and in 1938, the Civil Aeronautics Authority Act created the Civil Aeronautics Authority, later also the Civil Aeronautics Board, which consolidated all federal aviation regulation under a single agency. Just before World War II, the authority took over management of takeoffs and landings at airports as well. All of the air traffic was done on paper or boards, which used radio and math to estimate aircraft positions on a board, using small boat-shaped markers on maps known as shrimp boats. Possibly the greatest revolution came with World War II and the advent of radar. Radar immediately revolutionized air traffic control, and the CAA began using it at airports in 1946. By the early 1950s, approach and takeoff were done largely with radar, but extending coverage outside of airports stagnated thanks to budget cuts. That changed after two planes crashed over the Grand Canyon in 1956, killing all 128 on board. The accident occurred in uncontrolled airspace, where the planes were expected to avoid collision by pilot observation, a method called see and be seen. Exact details of the crash are uncertain, and the planes may have passed the same cloud on opposite sides before colliding. News coverage highlighted the woeful state of air traffic control, with the official accident report citing insufficiency of en route air traffic advisor information due to inadequacy of facilities and a lack of personnel in air traffic control. Eventually, millions were appropriated for an upgrade of the airway system, including major investment in radar surveillance equipment. Even this didn't fully remove danger, though, as military aircraft were not under the CAA authority and could not enter controlled airspace without warning. In 1958, for example, an F-100 Super Sabre collided with a United Airlines flight over Las Vegas, killing 49. This and other accidents led to the creation of a new agency which would have total authority over American airspace, including military traffic, the Federal Aviation Agency, or FAA, which was changed in 1966 to the Federal Aviation Administration. The NACA was also replaced by NASA in 1958, and in 1965, a NASA FAA coordinating board was created to strengthen the coordination, planning, and exchange of information between the two agencies. The two agencies have collaborated frequently since. Early cooperation included NASA's input on the Interagency Bird Hazard Committee, formed in 1966. Though not strictly related to air traffic control, all planes, of course, have to share the air with birds, and NASA has conducted research into technology that can identify flocks of birds and map seasonal flight patterns using radar to alter air routes to minimize strikes. Some airports use radar to identify bird hazards as well, and NASA itself uses the Merlin radar system to identify bird hazards during rocket launches. In 1966, NASA launched Applications Technology Satellite 1, among many other missions, it was used by the FAA to relay voice communications from the ground to aircraft to improve air traffic control over the oceans. After further testing the later ATS satellites, NASA concluded that satellites could provide high-quality, reliable, undelayed communications to improve effective traffic control for ships and aircraft over oceanic regions. Perhaps NASA's most important contribution to air traffic control began in 1968, when Ames researcher Heinz Erzberger first explored the idea of examining air traffic control concepts. At his instigation, several vital tools were developed. The Center TRACCON Automated System, or CTAS, the Traffic Manager Advisor, the En Route Descent Advisor, and the Final Approach Spacing Tool, called FAST. To understand the utility of these tools, it's helpful to understand how traffic control works in the U.S. at a basic level. At airports, airport towers manage flight traffic and control on the ground. After flights have taken off, the towers hand off control to TRACCONS, an acronym for Terminal Radar Approach Control. The FAA explains that TRACCON controllers generally handle within a 30 to 50 mile radius of an airport and up to 10,000 feet. They're responsible for the safe separation of aircraft in the busy areas surrounding airports. Once they leave that airspace, flight traffic control is handed off to one of 22 areas monitored by air route traffic control centers, who manage flights generally while they are en route at cruising altitude. As a flight approaches an airport, it is handed off to TRACCON and then to a tower as it descends and lands. 
CTAS automates a number of processes by generating advisories meant to assist human controllers in maintaining safety while attempting to reduce delays and optimize fuel efficiency. The Traffic Management Advisor specifically assists air route traffic control centers in forming plans for controllers to deliver aircraft from one of the 22 air regions to a track on near an airport. Managing where, when, how many, and how fast flights approach each airport are all important facets of maintaining air safety. The in route descent advisor is designed specifically to prevent small errors, such as a plane five minutes out of position, from cascading into major congestion problems. Working with CTAS and TMA, it generates specific instructions for each aircraft approaching an airport. Ideally, this helps reduce the time planes spend wasting fuel, taxiing, or circling the airport. Finally, the final approaching spacing tool assists track on controllers to place the most efficient sequence, schedule, and runway assignments for landing aircraft. When FAST was first tested in the mid-1990s at the Dallas-Fort Worth International Airport, controllers measured a 10 to 20 percent increase in airport capacity. In 1975, the FAA created the Aviation Safety Reporting System after a Transworld Airlines flight crashed into a Virginia mountain on approach to Dulles Airport. A United flight had narrowly avoided the same fate six weeks earlier, and the reporting system hoped to allow pilots to learn from other incidents. The FAA turned to NASA as a third party to manage the system. NASA also analyzed reports, identified priority issues, and disseminated reports based on the data collected. The aviation reporting system has improved air safety. According to NASA's Ames Research Center, between 1976 and 2009, the ASRS received more than 723,400 incident reports, which resulted in over 4,000 safety alerts and the instigation of 60 major research studies. From 2001 to 2004, NASA also conducted over 30,000 interviews, soliciting safety-related data from pilots, air traffic controllers, and others to identify system-wide trends and improve safety-related procedures, technologies, and training. In 1976, a combined project between NASA, the FAA, and the DOD led to the development of the Microwave Landing System. MLS was meant to improve earlier instrument landing systems, where pilots land planes using technology to land the plane using data from their instruments and not just visual information. MLS promised to increase the frequency of plane landings. NASA supported the system with copious research, including research into its use in air traffic control. MLS, however, was abandoned in 1994 when the FAA instead turned to satellite-based GPS. In 1985, NASA launched a tiny satellite designed by Weber State College called the NUSAT. NUSAT was deployed from the Space Shuttle Challenger and was used to optimize ground-based air traffic control radar systems. In 1996, President Clinton established a commission on aviation safety and security in response to the in-flight explosion and crash of Transworld Airlines Flight 800. The commission pressed the aviation community to reduce fatal accidents by 80% by 2006 and 90% by 2021. NASA responded by creating the Aviation Safety Program. The program had six research areas, with some aimed at making the airways safer while others focused on the aircraft themselves. The program led to significant safety improvements, including the glass cockpit, which uses LCD screens to simplify presentation of flight data. The program also led to the Performance Data Analysis and Reporting System, or PDARS, which used electronic sources to study the national airspace, measuring air traffic patterns, travel times, traffic flow, and more, producing nearly a thousand reports every day, which allowed the FAA to see a summation of air traffic control operations. All of these improvements and upgrades had to be rigorously tested before they could be certified for use for the FAA. To test ATC developments, NASA has numerous facilities and aircraft. Two of the most important are Langley's Airborne Trailblazer and a complement of air traffic control simulators located at the NASA Ames Research Center. In 1974, NASA acquired the first Boeing 737 ever built, modifying it to become the Boeing 737-100 Transport Systems Research Vehicle. For 20 years, it served as a testbed for various NASA tests and programs, from the glass cockpit to air traffic communications, the microwave landing system, and GPS-guided navigation. The 737 was retired in 1994 and a 757 acquired to be a new flying laboratory. The 757 was retired in 2006. The greatest amount of air traffic research within NASA takes place within the Aeronautics Research Directorate. This includes the development of the Airspace Concept Evaluation System, a computer that allows researchers to test air traffic theories by modeling the national airspace system. 
Researchers also developed the Future ATM Concepts Evaluation Tool, or FACET, which simulates advanced traffic control concepts. FACET can model the entire airspace on a single computer, modeling thousands of individual aircraft. FACET has been incredibly successful and has been used by the FAA, airlines, universities, and private companies, and won NASA's 2006 Software of the Year Award. To improve the traffic of aircraft on ground, NASA and the FAA cooperated to develop the Service Management System, which aims to reduce delays and stress on the system. Ames has developed some of the most sophisticated and powerful simulation laboratories, called Sim Labs. The Sim Labs support a range of research, not limited to air traffic control, but provide useful test beds for air traffic concepts. The Sim Labs include Future Flight Central, which simulates air traffic management in a two story building with full scale, 360 degree real time airport simulation. There's also the Vertical Motion Simulator, a flight simulator which can represent almost any aerospace vehicle and can be integrated with air traffic simulators for real time interaction. Ames also has the Crew Vehicle Systems Flight Facility, which has three main simulators. One is a Boeing 747 motion based cockpit. Another is an advanced concept flight simulator, and the last is an air traffic control simulator with 10 PC-based workstations. In 2003, after air delays made it clear that modernization was necessary, Congress enacted the Visions 100 Century of Aviation Reauthorization Act, which established the Joint Planning Development Office to manage numerous public agencies and private groups to modernize the American national airspace system. The JPDO came up with the Integrated National Plan for the Next Generation Air Transportation System in 2004, which involved numerous agencies, such as the Department of Transportation, the FAA, the National Weather Service, NASA, the DOD, and the TSA. NASA reorganized to support next-gen efforts through the Airspace Systems Program. Numerous technologies have already been deployed as part of NextGen, such as the Automatic Dependent Surveillance Broadcast B, which uses GPS to track aircraft, aiming to replace the World War II-era radar system. In 2014, NASA transformed the Terminal Sequency and Spacing software, meant to further simplify and improve track on airspace, to the FAA. NASA has also transferred the Flight Deck Interval Management technology, meant to help controllers more precisely manage and safely shorten the time between airplanes landing on a runway. The technology is meant to improve flight arrival times from within a few minutes to within 5 or 10 seconds. Of course, in the news today are frequent reports of close calls. While technology continues to advance, there are numerous challenges that face air traffic control. Staff shortages, the continued growth of air travel, and the increasingly complex nature of managing the national airspace. NASA continues to work on software and other concepts that they hope will streamline air travel, even as the number of flights and air travelers continues to grow. The FAA plans on finishing the implementation of the Next Generation Air Transportation System by 2030, and NASA continues to contribute and support the FAA implementation of ATD2 technologies. NASA has also partnered with airlines to develop software like the Digital Information Platform and the Collaborative Digital Departure Reroute, which can save millions of gallons of fuel. NASA is also working with the FAA on systems to integrate drones into the national airspace, as well as potential flying taxis. Although air travel promises to change in many ways in the future, NASA will continue to contribute to system management and safety. You might not know it, but NASA is with you every time you fly. I hope you enjoyed watching this episode of The History Guy. And if you did, please feel free to like and subscribe and share The History Guy with your friends. And if you also believe that history deserves to be remembered, then you can support The History Guy as a member on YouTube, a supporter on our community and locals, or as a patron on Patreon. You can also check out our great merchandise shop or book a special message from The History Guy on Cameo. 